Okay, um, I guess it's two o'clock now, so we can make a start. Um, so before we get on to the talk, I just want to run over some of the rules of the Hangout that we usually have. Um, so first of all, if everybody who isn't Scott could uh, mute their microphones during the talk, this just prevents the focus from shifting away from, from Scott during the talk. Um, of course, you are still welcome to ask questions and make comments during the talk. If you need to do that, you should use the chat room, which you can open. It's on the left-hand side of the window. There's a chat button. So if you need to ask a question during the talk, then please just put a note in there, and either Scott will see it or I will um, bring his attention to, to it. Um, if you're watching on the live stream, if you're not actually in the Hangout itself, then uh, you can leave comments and questions on the comments feed underneath the video, and uh, Daniel will be monitoring that during the talk and can bring up anything um, in the chat room here. Okay, so um, that's pretty much it. So I'd let me introduce today's speaker. Um, we've got uh, Scott Aronson, who's from MIT. He's a theoretical computer scientist who's uh, very well known in the quantum computing community. Um, he has a talent for translating any question you can possibly think of in the foundations of physics into a computational complexity question. And uh, he was recently awarded the Alan T. Waterman Award, which is a very prestigious uh, award for scientists across all di disciplines who are under 35 um, in the USA. So congratulations on that. And uh, today he's going to be talking to us about quantum money. So uh, over to you, Scott. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Matt, for inviting me. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, coming uh, uh, in whatever sense you're here. Uh, so uh, you know, I'm 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 grateful to be on uh, to uh, to be here and uh, you know to to be part of uh, the future of quantum computing talks uh, today, I guess. So uh, I want to tell you about uh, some work on uh, quantum money uh, from hidden subspaces. This is a joint work with uh, Paul Cristiano, who uh, actually just finished uh, his his undergrad uh, at MIT. Will be uh, going to grad school at Berkeley. And uh, that, by the way, is a, a, um, an Austrian, uh, I guess, old Austrian currency with uh, Erwin Schrodinger on it. Uh, okay, so um, okay, so uh, ever since there's been money, obviously uh, there have been people trying to counterfeit it. Uh, this is uh, an old problem. You know, it's even uh, uh, um, old from the standpoint of physicists being interested in it. Uh, many of you may know that. Uh, um, um, I, um, Sir Isaac Newton uh, uh, spent uh, uh, a lot of time, you know, in his, his post-physics career, I guess, as a master of the uh, British Mint, uh, where uh, one of the main things he worked on was uh, you know, making uh, English coins harder to counterfeit. Um, okay, he also personally oversaw the hangings of counterfeiters. That's not a solution that we're going to be able to uh, uh, pursue. Uh, you know, being theoretical computer scientists, we have uh, limited uh, uh, um, resources. So, so what can we do to make uh, money um, hard to counterfeit? Well, today what's done is, um, you know, uh, all sorts of things, uh, uh, depending on what country you're in. Uh, holograms may be embedded into a, a, a banknote. Uh, there may be uh, special inks, uh, what's called microprinting. Okay, but from a uh, uh, a computational perspective, you know, it's pretty obvious, but we don't have to convince you, this all just sort of leads to an arms race uh, with no obvious winner. Uh, why? Because, well, any technology that uh, uh, a bank can, can produce, well, in principle, you know, a, a motivated enough counterfeiter can produce as well. And indeed, that's exactly what you see happening. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, we could say uh, from a fundamental perspective, right, if money is just a represented somehow by a string of information, well, guess what? You know, information can be copied. You know, in fact, it can even be copied in linear time. Okay, so, um, uh, so, uh, so it just seems hopeless to have, you know, uh, like electronic cash that would let you, uh, you know, that could be authenticated, but they couldn't be copied. Okay, so what is done in practice about this uh, is, of course, uh, to have a trusted third party uh, that's in the middle to uh, authenticate the transactions. Okay, this could be a credit card agency, uh, it could be a service like PayPal, 
uh, you know, there's an interesting recent exception that proves the rule here, uh, which is called Bitcoin. Uh, this doesn't involve any central server to authenticate uh, transactions, but it still involves sort of this global community of uh, uh, Bitcoin users that's needed to sort of authenticate uh, each transaction in, in some distributed way. And in fact, sort of everyone has to maintain the entire record of all the transactions that have ever happened in the system. Okay, so it has, you know, some um, um, practicality issues, you know, not, not that quantum money doesn't either. But, uh, um, okay, uh, you know, now, you know, these are all sort of, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they work, you know, reasonably well on the internet, you know, except when, uh, uh, you know, someone manages to hack into one of the servers, as, you know, seems to be happening more and more these days, right? But, you know, uh, uh, sometimes we really want cash. Okay, uh, uh, so, um, uh, you know, we want, uh, um, you know, the convenience and anonymity that, that cash can provide. So, I mean, what kind of users would really require that? You know, well, uh, uh, pimps, drug dealers, money launderers. Okay, but, um, you know, I mean, we want to serve that user base as well, right? So, uh, so, so, so what can we do uh, if we really want uh, secure, say, electronic cash? Well, it just doesn't seem possible within the uh, limitations of classical physics. Okay, well, of course, you know, you all know where this is going, uh, uh, that uh, uh, quantum mechanics, you know, changes uh, the basic properties of, of information, you know, in so many interesting ways. And uh, uh, one of those is the no-cloning theorem, okay, which is, you know, simply the fact uh, that there is no physical procedure uh, consistent with the rules of quantum mechanics that takes as input an unknown quantum state even of a single qubit, and it produces as output a uh, tensor product of two copies of that state, or in fact even a, a very close approximation to that. Okay, and uh, you know the no cloning theorem is very closely related to uh, the uncertainty principle, you know which uh, which precedes it by many decades. Of course, right, in which says that you know there are uh, conjugate properties of a quantum state, like position and momentum, that both can't be measured, uh, they can't both be, be measured to unlimited accuracy. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, if you could measure, you know, all of the properties to unlimited accuracy, then this would let you clone a state. Conversely, if you could clone a state as many times as you wanted, then you could, you know, measure uh, uh, some properties of one copy and other properties of other copies, thereby violating the uncertainty principle. Okay, so, um, all of these things are, are related, you know, and of course, uh, uh, you know, from, from a modern perspective, you know, the no cloning theorem sort of almost immediately raises, you know, the possibility of, you know, for example, quantum money, having quantum states that, you know, let you sort of do something useful, but uh, that don't let you uh, make additional copies of that state. Okay, now this idea uh, was in some sense, you know, the first idea in the history of quantum information. It actually uh, predates uh, quantum computing, um, you know, even um, quantum cryptography uh, uh, by, by quite a bit. Uh, so uh, Stephen Wiesner, uh, in 1969, when he was a graduate student in physics at Columbia, uh, wrote a paper uh, suggesting this idea of quantum money. Now, um, he was unable to get the paper published for about 15 years. Uh, he since uh, left physics, and I believe that he's actually uh, herding goats somewhere. Okay, but um, let me tell you about you know his amazing and you know way ahead of its time a quantum money scheme. Okay, so it's it's something uh, very very simple. Uh, so the idea is that uh, to each banknote, you know, we would attach a collection of, of n qubits, um, each one uh, secretly prepared you know, in one of four states uh, uniformly at random. Okay, either the zero state, the one state, the plus state, which is just zero plus one over square root of two, or the minus state, which is zero minus one over square root of two. Okay, so, so the bank, you know, would, would attach these qubits to sort of each banknote that it distributes. Um, and then furthermore, uh, you know, each uh, uh, banknote would have a classical serial number attached to it, you know, just like uh, uh, our money today does, okay, in addition to these qubits. And now in a giant database, the bank would remember um, uh, 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 for each bill, you know, as given by a serial number, how it prepared each of the qubits on that bill, okay? So, um, 
So now, uh, you know, if you want to uh, verify a banknote, all you have to do is uh, take it to the bank. Uh, and the bank will look up the serial number in its database. You know, it will use its knowledge of how this uh, state was prepared um, um, uh, in order to measure each qubit in the appropriate basis. And, um, and then that will, uh, you know, and then if all of the measurements accept and it says that the money is good, you know, otherwise, uh, 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 if any of the measurements reject, the money is not good. Okay. So, um, you know, now, now the cool thing about this is that this is actually information theoretically secure, just assuming the validity of quantum mechanics. Okay. Intuitively, uh, if a counterfeiter, you know, doesn't know how these qubits were prepared, then, uh, you know, they're, you know, if they try to copy some of them, then, you know, they're, they're going to have to guess in which basis was a given qubit prepared, you know, the zero one basis or the plus minus basis. You know, for each uh, banknote, um, for each qubit, there's a, you know, half chance that they'll get it wrong. If they get it wrong, then not only will they fail to make a copy of this, of that qubit, but they'll even destroy the original copy. Okay? So, uh, you know, now that's not a rigorous security proof, right? Maybe there's some crazy entangled measurement that a counterfeiter could make that would, you know, make just a new copy of this banknote. Hey, but that turns out not to be the case. Now, interestingly, uh, there, as far as I know, there was no rigorous security proof for Wiesner's money until very recently. Uh, you know, uh, um, I actually asked the, uh, posed, posed it as a problem on the uh, theoretical physics stack exchange website. And I'm happy to say that uh, as a result of that, uh, John Watrous, uh, Abel Molina, and Thomas Vidic have recently, you know, shown that uh, uh, no counterfeiter, you know, who, who doesn't know uh, the state of uh, a Wiesner banknote can copy it with success probability greater than three-fourths to the n, where n is the number of qubits in the banknote. Okay, so, uh, you know, this was, the, this was an amazing uh, demonstration of what can be possible with quantum information. You know, in fact, it led more or less directly to the idea of quantum key distribution, quantum cryptography, which as many of you know, is already, you know, more or less practical today. Okay, uh, you know, but now what are the drawbacks of uh, Wiesner's quantum money scheme? Uh, well, you know, to start with the most obvious, uh, you know, there's what I'll call the Schrodinger's money problem. Okay, that uh, the, you have to somehow keep these uh, 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 quantum money states coherent, you know, and keep them from, from, you know, decohering in your pocket or something, right? This is really money that burns a hole in your pocket, okay? Uh, you know, if it decoheres, uh, you know, on a time scale of microseconds, you know, this is a big practical problem, right? Uh, you know, although, you know, if, you know, if you could even keep it coherent for, for maybe a few seconds, you know, then conceivably that could already be enough for some sorts of high frequency trading applications. But, uh, you know, anyway, uh, uh, you know, coherence, uh, you know, is certainly, you know, the central reason why quantum money is not yet practical you know, in contrast to, let's say, quantum key distribution, which, you know, while it's very similar, uh, does not require keeping qubits coherent for, for long periods of time, but, uh, but uh, you can just measure them immediately on arrival. Okay. Now, a second problem is that uh, in Wiesner's scheme, uh, the bank needs a giant database, you know, as I said, uh, describing for each banknote, you know, what is the serial number and how did it prepare the qubits on that banknote, right? So, uh, so the bank really needs to remember a lot of information. Okay, well fortunately, you know, there's a very simple solution to that problem, which was pointed out by Bennett, Breedbart, Broussard, and Wiesner in 1982. And that idea is that, you know, if you uh, consider the function which maps uh, the serial number of a banknote to, uh, you know, a description of the qubits on it. Well, then, you know, in Wiesner's scheme, that was a random function. But instead, we could simply replace it by a pseudo-random function. Okay? And if, uh, so a cryptographically secure, you know, pseudo-random function. Okay? And if we do that, then the bank will only need to remember one small piece of information, namely the key for that pseudo-random function. Okay? I mean, it better protect that key, uh, uh, ze zealously, right, because, uh, you know, if it, if it gets stolen, then the entire economy collapses, okay? But, uh, you know, using that key, right, you can, you, can, uh, uh, you can generate as many new bills as you want, pick a random serial number, you know, and, and so forth. And furthermore, if the resulting scheme could be broken, 
then you must also be able to distinguish the underlying pseudo-random function uh, from a random function. Okay? Why? Because you know, whatever counterfeiting strategy you have could itself be used as a distinguisher. Okay, so here, you know, we're, we're, you know, we can we solve this problem. Although you, you'll notice that in addition to quantum mechanics, now we're also making some comp some sort of computational complexity assumption. Okay, now a third problem. And this is getting into I think the really big ones uh, is that with Wiesner scheme, the only entity that knows how to verify uh, a bill as legitimate is the bank that printed it. Okay, and you could say that that you know in in that case. You know, we're sort of uh, eliminating many of the advantages of cash in the first place, right? If you, you know, if you're going to have to take a bill back to the bank anytime you want to verify it as genuine, well, then you know, why not just have a, a Mastercard or Visa or some third party authenticating the transaction? Okay, so what we really want is, you know, some quantum analog of, you know, any convenience store clerk being able to hold a bill up to the light and, you know, and see if it's good or not, right? So, okay, and now a fourth problem um, is that uh, in Wiesner's scheme, it turns out that actually as soon as you give, uh, uh, um, you know, individuals the ability to verify money themselves or even, you know, give them black box access to the verification procedure, then they become able to, uh, to, to break the scheme. Okay, and the reason why is very simple. It's basically that Wiesner's scheme, you know, uh, just relies on this collection of totally unentangled qubits. Okay, so let me show you how it works. Right, what you could do, what a counterfeiter could do, if he had access to the uh, verification procedure, would be you know take one legitimate banknote, start with one, um, then um, you know uh, just replace the first qubit by you know each of the four possibilities, you know, and then keep feeding the, res the resulting thing to the uh, verification oracle and see, you know, for which uh, uh, state of the first qubit does the thing accept. Okay, now crucially, this will not be damaging the other qubits because, you know, those are all just being measured in the correct basis, right? And a measurement in the correct basis is not damaging these, uh, these qubits at all. Okay, so, so after you've done this, you know, uh, at most four times, then you've learned uh, a correct classical description of the first qubit. Okay, so then just use that from this point forward, now try all the possibilities for the second qubit, okay, and so on until you've learned a complete classical description of the bill. Okay, so, um, so in this talk, you know, we're going to uh, be focusing on, you know, a new quantum money scheme that uh, will try to solve these uh, third and fourth problems, okay, and, you know, I'll, uh, I'll leave uh, the problem of keeping the money coherent as a, as a task for, uh, for, for the engineers. So, uh, so the modern goal is uh, what, what, um, what I like to call public key quantum money, okay, by direct analogy to public key cryptography. This is money that would be, you know, easy to prepare by a bank, uh, hard to copy, you know, and crucially verifiable by anyone, okay? So the picture to have in mind is that there is some central key generating authority which would generate both a public key and a private key. Okay, the public key gets announced to everyone, you know, uh, legitimate users, uh, customers, uh, counterfeiters, whoever. The private key is, is, is kept secret and is only given to the mint. Okay, now using the private key, the mint is then able to produce as many quantum banknotes as it likes, um, which it can then, you know, load into quantum ATMs or whatever, you know, and they can, um, people can take them out and can spend them. Okay, and then uh, any of these uh, banknotes can be uh, uh, verified uh, uh, efficiently using only the public key. Okay, and now crucially, a counterfeiter uh, who knows the public key, you know, and who has access to legitimate quantum money state should not be able to create more money uh, than he started with. Okay, so if you like formal definitions, you know, uh, I can give you one. Uh, so, uh, so basically, a public key quantum money scheme, or S, you know, is a, it consists of three polynomial time quantum algorithms. So there's the key generator that generates the private and public keys. There's the mint that uses the private key to generate the banknote. And there's the verifier that uses the public key to either accept or reject a claimed banknote. 
Okay, and there's basically two properties that we want from a scheme. The first is small completeness error. Okay, so that means that uh, legitimate money should be accepted with probability close to one. Right, that sounds pretty obvious. Okay, and the second thing is uh, small soundness error. Okay, and, and that means that uh, uh, sort of a counterfeiter should have a, a low probability of being able to sort of uh, increase its, its amount of money. Okay, we'll actually uh, um, uh, put a, a stronger requirement, okay, which, um, which says that if you consider any counterfeiter that has the uh, public key and that has Q legitimate banknotes, you know, for any polynomial Q, right, then, you know, and then let's say that this counterfeiter does whatever they want and they output some entangled state on more, on more than Q registers, say on R registers, right, could be, you know, some arbitrary state. If we then run the verification procedure on each of those R registers, then the probability that more than Q of them accept should be negligibly small. Okay, hopefully actually exponentially small. Okay, um, so this is, you know, turns out to be, you know, as far as we could tell, you know, sort of the right way to, form, to formalize this requirement that, you know, counterfeiter should not be able to print free money with, with any non-negligible probability. Okay, and, you know, incidentally, you know, uh, one can talk about private key quantum money schemes like Wiesner's original scheme, and those would be exactly the same thing except that we require that the public and private keys be equal. Okay, so let me make some basic observations uh, about this concept. First of all, you know, it's not a priori obvious that public key quantum money should be possible at all. Okay, and this is, you know, why I like the question so much, that it sort of it feels like a well-balanced question, right? It, you know, it's sort, of, it's sort of just on the verge of being possible, right? Because, you know, what you really want is uh, some procedure that can recognize, you know, a certain, you know, uh, that can give you measurements that would efficiently recognize a certain set of quantum states and yet not let you efficiently copy those things. Okay, so, you know, those twin requirements seem very much in tension with each other and, you know, I think it leads to, you know, a very interesting uh, um, challenge for quantum information. Okay, now, you know, we can certainly observe that if public key quantum money is possible, then just like public key cryptography, you know, certainly it will require computational assumptions, okay? So we can't get by, like with Wiesner's scheme, only on the validity of quantum mechanics. Now why is that? Well, you considered a counterfeiter who had unlimited computation time, you know, and access to the verification procedure. Well, such a counterfeiter could simply do a brute force search over all possible money states until they found one that the verification procedure accepted. Okay, um, you know, on the other hand, it's totally unclear which computational assumptions are going to work. You know, the standard assumptions in cryptography, even if we make them, they just don't seem like a great help here because, you know, how do you, from any conventional assumptions, sort of rule out a quantum copying strategy, which, you know, might be some totally bizarre thing that, that uh, you know, sort of doesn't falsify any kind of conventional assumption, okay? Uh, okay, now to address sort of a point that always comes up when, uh, when, when, uh, when we talk about quantum money, uh, you know, people ask, well, couldn't the very act of measuring the money uh, destroy it, okay? So, well, you know, that is indeed something you have to worry about here. In fact, you know, the Bennett et al. in 1982 came up with a term for quantum money that gets destroyed immediately upon verification, which was quantum subway tokens, okay? Uh, but uh, fortunately, it turns out that we can easily modify any decent quantum money scheme uh, into one where the money can be reused a large number of times, okay, at least where, where legitimate money can be reused many times. You know, uh, 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 counterfeit money might get destroyed, but that's okay, right? So, um, uh, so you know, uh, more formally, right, if the completeness error of a quantum money scheme is epsilon, then one can show that uh, just by sort of uncomputing the verification procedure, sort of running it backwards, you know, it's possible to uh, return a legitimate banknote to, uh, to a state which is at most square root of epsilon in trace distance away from the state that you started with. Okay, so in particular, you know, if epsilon is exponentially small, then the bill can be reused an exponential number of times. 
Okay, and well, you know, guess what? I mean, classical money wears out in a matter of years, you know, anyway, right? So, uh, you know, quantum money that could be reused, you know, an exponential number of times, you know, we won't, we won't worry if it gets if it gets worn out after that. Okay, uh, you know, and furthermore, we can amplify the completeness error uh, just by some simple repetition. Although we don't know how to similarly amplify the soundness error for quantum money schemes. Okay, so what is the prior art on this subject? Uh, so, um, on public key quantum money. So, okay, so I had a paper in the complexity conference uh, a few years ago where I uh, defined this concept and uh, I, I showed that one could have a secure construction uh, relative to a quantum oracle. Okay, so if everyone, the bank, the uh, customers, the counterfeiters, all have access to the unitary transformation of the black box, then I can design that unitary transformation in such a way that it, it, it lets you have secure quantum money. Okay, um, you know, on the other end, the, okay, I never published the security proof, unfortunately. You know, and I also, I had no idea how to turn this scheme into something explicit, okay, that wouldn't require this sort of uh, strange quantum oracle. Okay, I, I had a proposal for an explicit scheme uh, based on random stabilizer states. Um, that was uh, broken about six months later by, uh, uh, by uh, Andy Wudemersky, uh, Ed Farhi, uh, Peter Shore, John Kellner, and a group of other people. I, I actually joined the paper, which was breaking my scheme. Um, you know, seemed like the sporting thing to do. Uh, but, um, okay, so, uh, so, so in fact, you know, this, this group, uh, of uh, um, uh, Ed Farhi and uh, uh, Peter Shore and their students have, you know, uh, have been uh, have given us some, you know, intense competition in the quantum money business. Uh, you know, they had a, a very interesting scheme uh, just uh, from uh, a year or two ago, which was called Quantum Money from Knox. Okay, uh, this was a, a you know a scheme where the quantum money states are actually superpositions over objects called oriented link diagrams, okay, where uh, uh, you, uh, you measure some invariant called the Alexander polynomial in order to uh, verify the money is legitimate. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a very creative proposal. Unfortunately, not much is known about its security. Uh, you know, and this tends to be a common theme with, common, with, with quantum money, right, that about all you can say is, well, we tried to break it and it failed. Uh, uh, you know, or this scheme is secure under the assumption that it can't be broken, right? So, um, you know, in fact, even just characterizing the quantum states that, uh, that their verification procedure accepts, you know, seems like a very difficult problem, okay? Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, an abstract version of their scheme where you sort of get rid of the knots and use uh, oracles to achieve the same functionality. And there, you know, there's some hope that you could at least prove that Oracle scheme to be secure, but even that has not been done yet and uh, seems to us like a very difficult problem. Okay, now there's also been, you know, a good deal of research on how to attack quantum money schemes. Okay, and there's a very beautiful paper by Farhi et al. from uh, um, 2010 uh, that uh, is about what's called quantum state restoration. It actually gives you a very, very generic way to break you know, almost any public key quantum money scheme that does not involve highly entangled banknotes. Okay, so in some sense, you know, the, their attack gives some sort of explanation for why the quantum money schemes that I'm going to be talking about, you know, in the rest of this talk will involve uh, highly entangled banknotes. Okay, so now to uh, get to our work. So we have uh, a new public key quantum money scheme, uh, which is based on hidden subspaces of uh, the vector space uh, of, of binary strings, or, you know, F2 to the N. Okay, so let me t tell you how it works. Okay, okay, well, first, actually, let me, let me sell it to you. Let me tell you the advantages. So it's going to be much, much simpler than previous schemes. Um, the verifier uh, just projects onto valid money states, actually, by measuring in two complementary bases, like an original basis and a Hadamard basis. Um, you know, for the first time, we're going to be able to base the security of our scheme on an assumption, you know, admittedly a slightly exotic cryptographic assumption, but one that has nothing intrinsically to do with quantum money. Okay, so there will be some security assumption that's about the hardness of some problem, 
you know, computing a classical output from a classical input. Right? And if this problem is hard for a quantum computer, then our quantum money scheme is secure. Okay. Okay. And then furthermore, you know, uh, if you consider the abstract version of our schemes, the version involving a classical oracle, uh, we'll actually be able to prove that, that that is secure unconditionally. Okay, in other words, that any counterfeiter would have to make exponentially many queries to the oracle in order to copy the money. Okay, and that's, that's probably the main technical advance of this work. Okay, now actually as, as a bonus, uh, the exactly the same construction can also give us uh, the first private key quantum money scheme, which is provably, you know, unconditionally secure, uh, like Wiesner's scheme, but the unlike Wiesner's scheme uh, remains secure even if the counterfeiter is able to interact adaptively with the bank, okay, and, you know, submit, you know, uh, alleged bank notes and get, get back, you know, whether they worked or not and so forth. Okay, so um, the overview of our construction. So, you know, as a first step, we, we, we split the task of building a public key quantum money scheme into sort of two pieces. The first is what we call a mini scheme. Okay, this is like a, a, a quantum money scheme where you only need, first of all, you only need one banknote in existence in your entire currency system. Okay, and uh, second of all, uh, we sort of get rid of, you know, the whole problem of having a public and private key, right? So now the issue is that you're just given one specific banknote and it should be, which has some serial number attached to it and it should be hard to make a, a, a second bank note with that same serial number, okay? So this is like a drastic simplification of the, the task of, of quantum money, okay? And then the second thing is a, a digital signature scheme, you know, so just a way of signing messages, you know, in, in a way that, that sort of proves where they come from, okay? And that, of course, is one of the most basic primitives in classical cryptography, right? And we have you know, very plausible constructions of that that have nothing to do with quantum computing at all. Okay, so now, you know, an important result uh, which we proved is that uh, actually these two together are enough, by combining them, we can construct a full-blown public key quantum money scheme. Okay, and this actually builds on a previous work uh, from, um, oh, what a Mirsky at all. You know, the idea actually comes from them. You know, we just, uh, we, we do the security now. Okay, uh, so in fact it's known, you know, even how to get a signature scheme from any quantumly secure one-way function and the type of mini schemes that we'll be constructing, if they exist, then the one-way functions also exist. So you don't even have to, you know, uh, consider signature schemes to be a separate assumption. Okay, all right, so, so how, does, uh, how does the construction work? Uh, uh, how do you get quantum money from mini schemes plus signature schemes? Okay, well it's very simple. Suppose you have a mini scheme, which then you know gives you uh, banknotes that look like a serial number S together with a quantum money state rho sub S. Okay, well then all, all you're going to do is uh, your quantum money states will consist of S and rho sub S and a digital signature of the serial number S. Okay, so you di so you digitally sign the serial number sort of in order to prove that these bills came from you, you know, and not from not from some other renegade bank. Okay, and then to verify a banknote, you know, you just check that the quantum state is valid and then you check that the, the signature is valid. Okay, and uh, the theorem is that if you could counterfeit banknotes, uh, then either you must be able to break the underlying mini scheme or else you must be able to break the signature scheme. Okay, so that's a very nice property. Okay. So uh, with all that out of the way, now I can just proceed to tell you what is our mini scheme, okay? Because then once we have that, then we can get a full quantum money scheme in a more or less automatic way. Okay, so the way our, our hidden subspace mini scheme works is that a quantum money state will just be a superposition uh, over all the elements uh, uh, of some subspace A of uh, the vector space GF2 to the N. Okay, so that's the space of all, all n-bit strings, right, which under the operation of bitwise addition or bitwise exclusive order. Okay, and so, you know, a subspace is just, you know, uh, 
like the, the span of, uh, of some number of, of bit strings or under, uh, uh, under bitwise exclusive or. Okay, and in this case, we'll consider subspaces that have dimension n over 2. Okay, and we'll consider these subspaces to be chosen by the bank uniformly at random, you know, from the set of all possible such subspaces. Okay, so you take, you know, some n over 2 linearly independent generators, you know, and then the money state will be a superposition over all, you know, all of the 2 to the n over 2 uh, linear combinations of those generators. Okay, uh, so, you know, clearly the mint can, can you know, generate a random subspace and can efficiently prepare such a state. Um, you know, now the corresponding serial number, um, I won't tell you what it is quite yet. You should think of it as some sort of uh, data or, or code that allows you to verify membership in the subspaces um, A and also in the dual subspace to A, A per, okay, which is just the set of all vectors, so sort of the set of all uh, strings that have inner product zero with all of the strings in A, okay, and which is another subspace of dimension n over 2. Okay, so the serial number you should think of as some sort of program in an obfuscated way uh, allows you to verif allows you to check membership in A and also check membership in the dual subspace to A. And yet, somehow it should do this without revealing the generating sets for A or for A perp themselves. Okay. All right, and you know, we'll, we'll talk later about how do you do that. Uh, okay, but now, you know, assuming that you, you have, you know, that sort of black box ability to just to verify membership in A and in a dual subspace, I claim that it's quite easy to verify a, a, a given money state as legitimate, okay? So, so let me tell you how the verification procedure works, okay? So, so we start with some, you know, arbitrary superposition, right, over the elements of GF2 to the N. Okay, you know, in the honest case, this should be a superposition over the elements of the subspace A. Okay, but maybe it's not. All right, so how do we check whether it is? Okay, well, the first uh, step is to just use our A oracle to perform a projection onto the elements of A. Okay, if that fails, then certainly we can reject the money as bad. Okay, just suppose that that test accepts. All right, then we've got something, you know, which is supported only on the A elements. All right, so next, we just had a more all n of the qubits, or in other words, we apply a quantum Fourier transform over GF2 to the n. Okay, and that gives us um, an equal superposition, or you know, in the honest case, that would give us an equal superposition over A per. Okay, um, you know, that's what the Fourier transform does, right? It switches between a subspace and a dual. Okay, so next we apply a measurement that projects onto the elements of A per, and again, if that fails, we can immediately reject. Okay, um, and then fourthly, we just had to mark all the qubits again to return the state to what it was originally. Okay, and uh, there's a very nice fact that uh, this procedure simply implements, you know, a rank one projection onto, you know, the the uh, the subspace which is spanned by the valid money state A. Okay, so uh, you know it accepts valid money with probability one, and it you know it, it rejects. Uh, anything orthogonal to the valid money with probability one. Okay, so the verification is about as clean as you could possibly hope. Okay, but now what can we say about the security of the scheme? Okay, well what you have to imagine is some counterfeiter, you know, that has, you know, uh, valid banknotes, or you know, in the case of the mini scheme, just one valid banknote. You know, and then also, you know, for each banknote that he has, has a has membership oracles for the associated subspace and also for the dual of that subspace, okay, and, you know, is able to query those oracles. Okay, so intuitively, what can a counterfeiter do? Okay, well, you know, a counterfeiter could, could measure uh, uh, the, the quantum money state, but, you know, that doesn't seem very helpful because he just, he's going to destroy the money and he's just going to get out one element, you know, of, of the subspace or his dual, depending on which basis he measures, right? And one element is not good enough to, uh, to, to, to make new money, okay? So he's just, you know, uh, completely wasted uh, his money, okay? Uh, you know, now another thing a counterfeiter could do is try to query the oracles uh, in order to eventually learn a generating set for, you know, for the subspace or for its dual, okay? Now that could eventually succeed, 
you know, since you know, ultimately the oracle does specify these subspaces. Okay, but how long will that take? Well, if the if the counterfeiter, you know, just used, let's say, Grover's algorithm, right, which is as we know is the fastest possible, you know, black box quantum search algorithm, you know, in order to try to find uh, non-zero elements of A or of A curve, then it's not hard to see that the counterfeiter would have to query the oracle something like two to the n over four times. Okay, finding each element, you know, will take like two to the n over four times, and you need something like n elements. Okay, so. Um, uh, so, so this requires, you know, a, a, an exponential number of queries. Okay, so, uh, so, so this is not efficient. Okay, but now, you know, the, the interesting or novel aspect of this of this setup is that uh, really the counterfeiter has both resources available at once. Okay, so he has the oracles that can recognize, uh, you know, the valid money states and you know, recognize the elements of A and of A perp. He also has you know, at least one copy of uh, of the valid money state. Okay, it's just just at the very beginning. So the question is, using both of these resources combined, can you counterfeit the money? Okay, and you know, what well, one you would need to show that the answer is no. That even with both of these things together, that you still need exponentially many queries to copy the money. Okay, so what's interesting is that what we want here is, in some sense, a common generalization of the no cloning theorem and of the uh, BBBV theorem, which is the, the optimality of Grover's algorithm. Okay, so, uh, you know, I put a reward for this of a million quantum dollars. Okay, okay. so, uh, so we, we introduce a technique for uh, proving uh, low quantum lower bounds of this kind. You know, the idea is uh, sort of an extension of uh, Andres Ambayanis's uh, celebrated quantum adversary method. Uh, you know, the, the main idea is to look at the inner products between um, um, uh, the, the states corresponding to uh, what we call neighboring subspaces. Okay, so I'll consider two n over two dimensional subspaces, say A and A prime, to be neighboring. You know, if you get from one to the other by replacing, you know, exactly one basis element. Okay, uh, so that's. Um, you know, or, or if their intersection has dimension n over two minus one, guess, right? So now, you know, you know, imagine that that we have a quantum money state, and it's one of two neighboring uh, states, it's either a superposition over elements of A, or it's a superposition over elements of A prime. Okay. Well, so now we can look at what is the inner product between those two states. And it's not hard to see; it's one over the square root of two, right? On the other hand, suppose that we'd had a counterfeiting procedure uh, and it succeeded. Then what, what would have to happen? Well, it would have to map, you know, the state A to two copies of A, you know, or something close to that. Okay, it would also have to map A prime to two copies of A prime, or something close to that. Okay, so now what is the inner product between A tensor 2 and A prime tensor 2? Well, it's a half. Okay, so, you know, the inner product was actually, you know, decreased from 1 over square root of 2 to a half. Okay, and so, so, you know, and furthermore, this must have been happening for every neighboring pair simultaneously. Okay, so any successful counterfeiting algorithm, if it existed, must have been sort of decreasing the inner products between many sort of neighboring pairs of quantum money states. Okay, and this is the crucial observation that we use. Okay, because we can then show, you know, using um, an adversary argument, that by making a single query to the oracles, you know, the oracles that, you know, test membership in these subspaces or in their duals, uh, it is only possible to decrease the inner products by some, an exponentially small amount, like 2 to the minus n over 4. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, now actually if for, for a specific pair, you can decrease the inner products by a lot, Okay, so, you know, what we need to argue is that, well, for most pairs, you can't do it. Okay, the expected decrease in inner product across all the neighboring pairs is exponentially small. Okay, and then this then implies that any successful counterfeiting algorithm has to make uh, exponentially many oracle queries. All right, so, so that's the idea of uh, the, uh, the, the, the proof of, of security of the, of the public key scheme, you know, in the case where, uh, um, where, where uh, the, you know, you, you only get to learn about the subspaces by querying these oracles. 
Now, what's nice is that that proof already, you know, without any further work, you know, already uh, gives you a private key quantum money scheme uh, not involving an oracle, uh, which is secure against interactive attacks. Okay, and the way that this works is that um, the bank, you know, will now just, you know, remember, just like in Wiesner's scheme, you know, a serial number for each bill that it distributes along with a description of the bill, which now will be a description of a subspace, you know, of GF2 to the N. Okay, and then, you know, each banknote will, will be, will consist of a serial number and then superposition over the subspace element. Okay, and the bank can then publishes those and then, you know, uh, users, you know, can send these bills back to the bank for verification. Okay, now, the uh, nice thing is I claim that even given adaptive access to the bank, uh, it is still not possible to counterfeit the money, you know, with a, using a, a polynomial number of, of bank accesses. Uh, okay, now why is that? Well, suppose otherwise. Okay, suppose that, that someone could copy the money. Okay, well then, uh, you know, in, our, in the setting of, of our public key money, you know, you could just uh, simulate whatever the bank was doing, okay, using those oracles. Uh, and that would give you a way to break the public key oracle scheme, which we already showed was secure. Okay, so so we sort of get this private key scheme as a freebie. All right, but now you know, let's say that we want public key quantum money in the real world and not assuming any oracle. Okay, well in that case, we still face an extremely interesting challenge, although you know, in some sense now not one that has anything to do with quantum mechanics anymore. Okay, we now face sort of a classical cryptographic challenge. Okay, which is how do how do you actually give someone computer programs that let them you know test membership in the two subspaces A and A dual, and yet do it without revealing you know the uh, uh, A itself. Okay, so you know you you know you can think about this question. You know we're open to uh, to novel proposals for how to do it. You know, I can tell you the best, uh, the best proposal that we came up with, okay, uh, which is uh, 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 to use uh, multivariate polynomials in order to sort of hide these subspaces. Okay, so, so the idea for sort of for our explicit scheme or, you know, our sort of real world, you know, uh, 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 scheme is that uh, for each money state, A, uh, the mint will publish as the serial number of A, uh, a collection of uniformly random uh, degree D polynomials, okay, for some small d. Um, so call these polynomials, say, P1 up to P2n and Q1 up to Q2n. Okay, and these will be polynomials, you know, um, from GF2 to the n to GF2, okay? And now the crucial property is that all of the, 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 the PIs should vanish on A. Okay, so these should all be random polynomials, but which are chosen to, to all vanish on the subspace A that we're trying to hide. Okay, the QIs should all be chosen randomly, but to vanish on the dual of A. Okay, so, um, okay, now, you know, an important fact is that, you know, these, such polynomials can actually be generated in polynomial time, as long as the degree is constant. Okay, you could just generate them to span, you know, on some canonical subspace, like the span of the first n over two uh, 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 variables, you know, and then just apply a linear transformation to get, you know, the polynomials that you want that, that vanish on, on the subspace that you want. Okay, so, so yes, such polynomials can be generated that will be random, except that they happen to vanish on the subspace A or on its dual subspace. Okay, now furthermore, you know, if you have these subspaces, then certainly you can use them to verify a quantum money state, right? Because you can use, you know, the PIs in order to test membership in A, just check whether they all vanish, right? If, you know, if X is in A, then they will all vanish. If X is not in A, then with overwhelming probability, at least one of them will not vanish, okay? Likewise, you can use the QIs in order to decide membership in A dual, okay? So, so these, you know, let you implement the oracles that we need for our quantum money scheme to work. Um, on the other hand, if I give you only these polynomials, you know, it's far from clear how you would actually, how you would use them to find any non-zero elements of A or of A perp 
in polynomial time, even using a quantum algorithm. Okay, you know, now this is closely related to various things that people have studied in, in, uh, in the classical cryptography world. You know, I mean, uh, you know, they're, they're still, you know, relatively obscure, you know, things, but, you know, there have been, there have actually been papers published about this kind of thing, right? So, by the standards of quantum money, this is like rock solid cryptographic assumption. Okay. Uh, you know, now, uh, what can we say about, you know, the, the security? Well, you know, okay, so certainly if the polynomials have degree one, if they're linear, then this is all trivial to break, right? And it's just like I'm publishing the subspaces for you. You know, even if the, the polynomials are quadratic, the scheme can still be broken using some results from the theory of quadratic forms, uh, where, you know, you can put things in some canonical form that sort of reveals the hidden subspaces. Okay, if the uh, degree is three, so you've got cubic polynomials, then already we don't know how to break the scheme. So maybe it's secure, you know, even there. But there's some non-trivial structure in the cubic case, you know, that maybe an attacker could exploit. Okay, so to stay on the safe side, our recommendation is degree four polynomials. Okay, you know, that were, you know, there were really, really confident. All right, maybe degree five or six. But, um, okay. Um, you know, you can let some of the polynomials be decoys, you know, to improve the security further, potentially, if, if you want. Uh, okay, now, you know, the, the, the key sort of theorem that we're able to prove about this, this scheme um, is that uh, um, so its security follows from what we call a direct product assumption. Okay, so here's the, the cryptographic assumption that we need to make. Okay, the assumption is the following that if I give you these, the polynomials, say the PIs and the QIs, which hide the, uh, the subspace A, then there is no polynomial time quantum algorithm which is able to find, find the generating set for A, even with success probability like 2 to the minus N over 2. Okay, so, you know, if you think about, okay, like, like well, what if you just guess the subspace at random? Okay, well, then you would succeed with probability like 2 to the minus n squared, right? So, so this is saying that, you know, basically, you know, that there's no quantum algorithm that's going to do that much better than random guessing, okay? You know, even if you, you only need to succeed with exponentially small probability, but, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's too, you know, uh, but it, it's, it, it's too mild of an exponential, right? Then you're still not going to do it in quantum polynomial time. Right. Now, this is a somewhat exotic assumption, but you'll notice that, you know, right, you know, it seems kind of plausible, and crucially, it only talks about the hardness of a classical problem. Okay. Now, the theorem we can prove is that assuming only that, that assumption, our quantum money scheme, you know, involving the polynomials is secure. Okay. And there's some security reduction where, you know, if you had a counterfeiter that uh, uh, made copies of our money, then we would be able to convert it to an algorithm that violated the, 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 the direct product assumption. Since I'm running out of time, I don't think I'll go into the security reduction unless people want to know more about it. Okay, so uh, concluding thoughts. Um, you may wonder, you know, why, why are we worrying about quantum money given that, you know, keeping a quantum state coherent for months or years or however long you'd need you know, seems like it you know, might be even further from practicality than scalable quantum computing. All right, well, you know, one answer that I like to give, right, is, you know, sort of the, the philosophical one, right, which is that in the early days of quantum mechanics, you know, uh, people like, uh, like Bohr, uh, you know, or like, like Heisenberg, like uh, Eddington, I guess, uh, you know, were making arguments that, you know, the uncertainty principle uh, you know, should change our conception of science itself in some way, right? Because, uh, you know, the, this principle or, you know, today we could invoke the no-cloning theorem, right? But what, you know, these things really mean is that, you know, even given complete knowledge of the laws of physics, you know, physical systems can always surprise us in some sense just due to our inability to know uh, their initial states. Okay? Now, you know, but you can't, does this sort of argument have any teeth to it? You know, and to me, uh, quantum money is interesting, you know, largely because it just provides a very, very nice playground for sort of testing this, this claim, you know, while sort of also highlighting the role of computational complexity, right? So the question is, you know, among the states that sort of cannot be copied, 
you know, for the because of the no cloning theorem, you know, are there any cases where you would actually want the copy to stay? Where it actually, you know, where the quantum state actually hides or encodes some sort of useful or interesting behavior, right? And so, um, you know, quantum money gives us a very interesting uh, test case where the answer to that question is yes. Okay, uh, you know, I could also mention that sort of even if it decohered in a matter of seconds, you know, I think public key quantum money could still have applications. Uh, one of my favorites are. Uh, 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 what I call non-interactive unclonable signatures. This would be a way of sort of proving your identity, you know, proving who you are by sort of giving out this quantum money state. Now, you know, it, it may decohere, you know, uh, very, very quickly. So the person has, you know, that, that you give it to has to authenticate the state, you know, uh, sort of while it's hot, right, before it decoheres. Okay, now, if, you know, in these sorts of schemes, if the person, if, if, if the recipient figured out a way to keep the uh, the state coherent for a long time, then uh, um, he or she could use the state to impersonate you. So they would break the signature scheme. On the other hand, whatever technology they were using to keep the state coherent, we could then use it to get quantum money. So, you know, I feel like we win either way. Okay. Uh, so, you know, a few open problems. Uh, you know, obviously to break our scheme uh, with the polynomials or to get stronger evidence for its security. Uh, you know, are, could there be other ways besides polynomials of hiding complementary subspaces? Okay, uh, one thing that we don't know at all, uh, could there be secure public key quantum money schemes uh, relative to a random oracle? Okay, we only showed that it's possible relative to sort of very specially designed oracles. Uh, so if you want private key quantum money, is there an inherent trade-off where you need either a giant database as in Wiesner's scheme or else a cryptographic assumption, as in the BBBW scheme. Okay, and then, you know, can you make quantum money more practical, right? How do you, how do you keep even one qubit coherent for, you know, uh, a long enough time? Okay, uh, you know, a, a future direction that I'm very excited about is quantum software copy protection. So uh, here the question is, can you have a quantum state that lets you compute some function f, but that does not let you uh, create more states that also let you compute that same function. Okay, and uh, it's very cool is uh, that Paul and I, just using a variant of the hidden subspace machinery uh, that I showed you uh, today, actually we, we think that we can achieve this now. Uh, for basically any class of functions f, you know, at least relative to, uh, uh, to an oracle. Okay, and we're, we're working on, you know, can we eliminate the oracle and get this to work in the real world. Okay, you know, another thing you may be able to do would be quantum code obfuscation, where I give you a quantum state that lets you compute some function, okay, but this, having the state is sort of no more, you know, is no different than just having a black box for the function, right? You can use this, you can measure the quantum state in a way to learn f of x for any input x, but you can't learn anything else uh, by measuring the state. So these are some of the, you know, exciting things, you know, besides quantum money that may be possible with these sorts of ideas. So uh, at this point, I'll stop and I'll take questions. So, so thank you. From the live stream. Uh, All right. Uh, do you have the chat window open? Uh, let's see. Just give me one second. Um, um, so. Uh, if people who are in the Hangout have questions, then uh, can you please uh, put a comment in the chat window so I can uh, I can see? Uh, sure. So oh, okay. So I just look at the comments in the uh, in the Q Plus Hangout. Uh, no, no. So well, I can just read the question to you. All right. So, Why uh, don't you read the questions to me? Thanks. Yeah. So um, the first question was from uh, Ludovic Parrott. Uh, okay. He wanted to know if the polynomials P1 to P2n have to be mm -hmm. homogeneous. Ah, uh, question. So uh, I don't think that they have to be. It's just that you know the uh, in in the scheme that, that we came up with, sort of they, they they might as well be, and that's you know the uh, uh, you know one one um, you know one 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 can design right. I mean I mean anything that that has the you know that achieves the the desired end of hiding the subspaces, you know, and of letting us authenticate the valid money is going to be good enough for us. And non-homogeneous polynomials could work for that as well. Just you know, in our particular implementation, they they, they happen to be homogeneous. 
Okay. Um, so there was also another question um, from David Young Mello, uh, okay. who wanted to know uh, if you could use the proposed scheme to represent different denominations of money. So Absolutely. There's no no problem at all with that, right? You know, you could just have uh, different uh, different labels for you know uh, five dollar banknotes, you know five euro banknotes, you know or whatever. Yeah, that that that, that that's not a problem at all. Um, okay. Um, well, let's move on to the questions from people in the Hangouts. So there's questions from IQC. So um, if you if you guys want to go ahead and start asking your questions. Right. Hi, Scott. This is David. Hey. Hi. Hey. I'm all right. How are you? Good. Thanks. So my question is about a decision problem related to your scheme. Okay. Suppose that you have, uh, you know, you're Arthur, and you want to. Mm -hmm have uh, membership oracles for a subspace A and a subspace B. Yeah. And decide whether or not B equals A per. So uh, okay, wait, wait. So you have membership oracles for A and B, and you want to decide whether A equals B per? Right. So okay. So done in NP, because you can just hand, Portland can just hand you the generators. But then you learn all the generators and you learn the subspace. But uh -oh. It can be done without you learning all the generators. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe there's some other clever way that you could do this, sort of in a zero knowledge way, classically. But my my question is, do you think that you can? And if not, does it provide a separation between quantum and classical zero knowledge? Uh, okay. So, so you're asking about sort of a, a, I guess, a different problem, right? Not not something that would be necessary for quantum money, but. Uh, you know, some some other uh, uh, problem where where you want you want to you want to um, what what you want to hide two subspaces A and uh, and B so that you know in, in such a way that it's hard to tell whether A is equal to B per. I mean I, I mean you could try to use the polynomial scheme to achieve things like that, right? You could give you could publish one set of polynomials that. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, do you know A and do you know uh, B uh, B per? I mean, in advance, I mean. Well, I'm not sure like if I understand the setting. But. Suppose you're given multivariate polynomials that verify yes. A and verify B. Yes. And then your question is, does A equal B per? Right. Ah. Uh, oh, okay. So, oh, all right. So, so you're saying that the problem is that you could uh, uh, sort of just do a transformation of one polynomial and see if it gives you the other. No, I think that's the difficulty here. Do I understand correctly? Um, well, my question really is just, it's kind of open-ended, but it's really just about, you know, your scheme gives you a protocol that yes. lets you verify that A equals B per without mm -hmm. learning what A is. Yeah. Do you think you can do that classically? Uh, is there a witness that you, I mean, is there a protocol classically which lets you verify that A equals B per without learning A? Oh, uh, is there a protocol that lets you verify that, that A equals B per uh, without learning A? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good intuition about it. I would have to think about it more. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. No. So are there any other questions from the IQC group before we move on? Okay. Um, if not, uh, there was a question from the chat room from okay. Sam Kalb. It's just, um, he says it's a silly question. Right? It's not a silly question. He's basically asking uh, about resistance to errors. So mm -hmm. uh, can you make a scheme that's resistant to um, errors other than coming from the counterfeiter? Yeah. Okay. That's, so that, that's an excellent question. So, you know, so obviously if you actually tried to build this, right, you know, then you'd have an enormous practical problem, right, of, you know, even perfectly valid money could be, you know, decohering in your wallet, as I said. Okay, so, uh, you know, as, as far as we were able to tell, you know, the issues in sort of dealing with those sort of errors, you know, ba are basically uh, amount to, you know, the same issues as in, uh, you know, uh, fault tolerance, right, in, in quantum computation. Okay, so, uh, uh, so in principle, you know, it ought to be possible to sort of keep, you know, quantum money uh, coherent, you know, against, uh, uh, you know, decoherence errors for an arbitrarily long time, you know, by using the machinery of, uh, of quantum fault tolerance, okay, by, 
taking your your quantum money states, you know, the state A or whatever, and uh, and then um, you know encoding them uh, using you know uh, quantum error correcting codes, right? And then you know doing some active error correction, so you're constantly you know monitoring to uh, uh, each qubit to see if it's you know if it's decohered, and you're you know and you're keeping the information that you want in some protected subspace. Okay, so you know, in principle, that ought to work. You know, just as it you know, it ought to work in principle for for quantum computation. Okay, you know, so you know, maybe you know, maybe you know, the most interesting question here is sort of, is there something you can do for quantum money which wouldn't require the full power of quantum error correction, right? So you know, if you just want to fault tolerantly compute the identity function, right? You know, just keep your your money from uh, from disappearing, right? Is there is there something better that you can do? That that I don't know. Okay, are there any other questions for Scott? Um, if not, then uh, let's thank Scott again uh, for his excellent talk. Um, and uh, so before we go, let me just. Uh, tell you that we, the talks coming up in July and August, we've got uh, Kastlaf Bruckner in July and we've got, uh, uh, wait, what is it? It's uh, Fran Francesco Buscemi in, uh, in August. Um, if you have suggestions for future talks, then uh, there is a, a spreadsheet which you can add them to. So we're very happy to take su suggestions for speakers. In fact, uh, you know, uh, would rather have the speakers that people actually w would like to see. So the, the URL for that is uh, bit.ly forward slash Q plus suggestions. So Q plus suggestions, all one word. Um, okay, and uh, finally, uh, usually, so that's the, the end of the formal proceedings of the Hangout. Usually Daniel and I will stick around uh, for a little while to discuss, uh, you know, administrative things or the future of the Hangout. So if you if you have any comments about today's Hangout or about Q Plus in general, then you can stick around for that. But otherwise, uh, thanks very much, uh, Scott, again for the talk, and uh, thanks for everyone for showing up today. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks to all of you for uh, for for showing up. This was a lot of fun. It was, it was also, you know, it was especially fun to see, uh, you know, all the places and going, you know, places I visited, places I want to visit, and you know, sort of just see them all at once in different screens. So. Cool. Great.